And in my world, the concept of a superpower is the thing that you do that's better than everybody else you know. And it is my fundamental belief that everyone has a superpower. Everyone. Welcome to Create New Futures. Thought-provoking conversations with leaders, experts, and interesting minds. Join us as we explore ideas and reflect on practices that you can use and apply to create and shape the future. With your host, author, and strategy consultant, Aviv Shahar. Welcome to Create New Futures, where we develop conversations with successful leaders to explore how you can create new futures for you and for your business. This is Aviv, and today I'm speaking with Court Lorenzini. Court is the founder and CEO of multiple successful technology startups, including DocuSign and Metabright. Concurrently, Court serves on the boards of several early-stage companies and is an active investor and advisor in the Seattle area. Over his career, Court has raised over $170 million in venture and strategic funding. I initially met Court on the board of Utrip, a destination discovery and planning platform startup where we both serve as advisors and board members. I have found Court to be one of the smartest people about business. In this conversation, I explore with Court his formative experiences, when at the age of 12, he regularly participated with his father in the first Band of Angels, the Silicon Valley's oldest seed funding organization. Court reflects on capturing his learning and insights in his ideas journal and the discoveries he made that shaped his journey, such as his focus on the superpower concept, the five-year cycle, his determination to build a portfolio of companies, and what he has learned from each of his startups. This is a rich conversation with many ideas and insights that you'll want to capture and then implement immediately in action. Court, it's great to have you here. Welcome. Thanks, Aviv. It's lovely to join you. Let me first ask you, what are you currently working on? My most recent project is a company called Metabrite. And I started this about six years ago uh, with a vision for collecting uh, giant scale of consumer purchase information. Uh, the idea behind it is that uh, manufacturers uh, who produce the products we all buy have very little insight into who actually buys their product. Those, uh, that data is typically uh, managed and maintained by the retailers who surprisingly do not share it with the manufacturers uh, with much detail. And so my hope is to use Metabrite as a method to liberate a lot of that data to make uh, manufacturing more efficient and give them better decisioning uh, capabilities. And there is a technology breakthroughs that support this venture? We have spent the last six years building a piece of technology that has never before been done. And I think uh, a number of companies have tried to do what we're doing, but have failed. And, and that is the ability to read information uh, from printed purchase receipts and actually resolve it down to the items specifically purchased, which is a lot harder problem to solve than it sounds <laughs> at its face. So I think you explained to me in the past that machine learning is a piece of that for people that are, for non-technologists, what is machine learning and what is the unique application that you have developed uh, to make MetaBright a reality? So I'll answer that in the opposite order, which is to say, through example, if you consider a can of Campbell's soup, which is a ubiquitous product that can be bought almost anywhere, the interesting thing about that can of Campbell's soup is that when it is stocked on the shelf of a retail establishment, it is done, uh, it is entered into their point of sale system by a local clerk who's, you know, paid a minimum wage and they enter into that point of sale system any description that comes to mind, which means that that same can of soup sold over thousands and thousands of different retail locations will all be represented with different descriptions on each individual receipt. 
So therefore, the problem we ended up having to solve technically is how to figure out from the thousands or tens of thousands of different descriptors that can be used to describe a simple can of Campbell's soup times millions and millions of products and hundreds of thousands of retail outlets, what exactly does that line item on that receipt specifically point to? And it's a problem that cannot be solved with people. It can only be solved with machines. And so the concept of machine learning is that if you give a computer a specific set of training information and a means by which to learn from that, so you use algorithms to effectively teach the machine what to look for based on what it has seen in the past, you can uh, create a machine learning scenario where over time uh, it can get better and better at predicting, uh, even with imperfect data, what the, out what the outcome is. And so that's the piece of technology we developed. And it's been uh, many years and tens of millions of dollars of investment, and yet we've got something working that's never been done before. And we're pretty proud of it. That's extraordinary. So I am very fascinated in this process of identifying an opportunity or rather identifying a problem that no one solved before and configuring in your mind a strategy and approach to create a solution for it. And, and so, but what I'd like to do is actually trace to the beginning of your journey and trace through a number of your ventures and successful companies. And as we talk about those companies, to also get the behind the, the camera of, of a hidden process in your mind where you come up with the idea and you then lead it into a successful business. So the, perhaps the best place to begin is if, if you trace the beginning of your journey, what inspired you when you were growing up? What were some of those early influences that prepared you to the life of um, an entrepreneur? <laughs> Great question. And I, I love answering this one because I can give very specific credit to a very important person in my life, which is my dad. He is, again, an entrepreneur's entrepreneur. He was incredibly uh, gifted in, in running and starting early stage companies. And I, you know, I love saying the fact that, that my father invented the process for growing uh, single crystal silicon at commercial scale, which means that he was one of the eight people credited with founding Silicon Valley and creating the entire current, the present that we now understand as being the digital present. Because um, commercial silicon production before he came up with the process was not possible and was done only in the laboratory in the late 50s, early 60s. Uh, and it meant that the beginning of the integrated circuit was possible. And so my formative years uh, growing up were watching him you know, start his first two companies in this arena. One he sold, the second one he, he built very large and eventually took public. And along the way, he was one of the team that discovered uh, photovoltaics, which is the technology behind uh, solar power. When, so I was very early in watching solar become a, a, a technology being brought to life. And then later on, as I got older, into my early teens, uh, he was one of the very first venture capitalists to take root in Silicon Valley. Uh, and later still, I was one of the three people that founded the very first angel investment group in the United States called Band of Angels. And it was just an incredible opportunity. We had you know, the, the early leaders of technology uh, at our house on a regular basis. And these were just family friends that would stop over and have dinner with us and we'd go on vacations with. And I can remember so many interactions with those people as, as a young man and hearing their stories and just really getting excited about, you know, what they were doing in the world. They, those guys were the guys really changing the world. You know, we're talking, you know, 1960s, 70s, and early 80s. Um, it was just an extraordinary time to, to be connected. So if you try to decode or really take us into the, the mind of the 11, 12, 13 year old that you were and, and what are some of those, apart from obviously the, the confidence that you can make tremendous impact and the, the visionary energy that's probably all around you, what are some key ideas or insights 
that you are assimilating at that point consciously if you can try to trace that? In fact, there's a, there's a, I can really put a finger on that one, a couple of instances, but one in particular. One of the things uh, that my father uh, did, his, his venture capital fund had six partners. And of the six partners, they had an interesting pattern, which was once a month, one of the six partners would host a dinner at their home for the other five partners. They would come to the house, drink, eat, have a great time. And then over dessert and drinks, they would exit the dinner table and go into the living room room of the host and receive a single presenter. A, an entrepreneur would come into this person's home at night and give a pitch to them while they sat there listening and drinking and smoking. And, I, and for the twice a year, for the, all the early years of my life, I was able to sit in on the dinner, the presentation, and most importantly, the conversation after the fact. So that the entrepreneur would be, you know, they would thank him, they would show him out the door, and then they would sit there for the next hour and digest and discuss what was good about that presentation or bad or this idea uh, and how, my, how they, would they choose to fund it or not, why or why not. And just listening to them walk through the process, critique these presentations, understand what it took to be, that they felt it took to be a successful entrepreneur was so, it was like a, a crash course, the best crash course available. And these were some of the most successful businessmen in Silicon Valley at that time. So that was just a huge opportunity that I did not, did not go wasted on me, believe me. <laughs> Right, so and and that's thirty or forty years before shark shark tanks were, were put on TV and and other su such uh, scenarios. That was the the genesis of it all. Yeah, it was incredible, and and you know, so this is uh, this was sort of the the crucible that I credit with giving me not only the desire to be an entrepreneur, but an understanding of the language of venture capital, the motivations behind the funding and what it took to be successful in terms of both presenting, raising money, getting a business off the ground. So that was a big part of it. My own personal journey at that point was really, you know, I started working uh, a full-time job when I was 14 years old. Um, I actually got an opportunity to, of all things, work in an upholstery shop. You know, just a guy hired me to help him move furniture was the job he asked me to do. And what was interesting is that I got in there and of course I helped him move his furniture. And then I realized that his inventory was pretty much in disarray. And I said, would you like me to help you organize that? And he said, oh my God, that'd be great. So then I spent several weeks helping him organize his in inventory. And then it was, well, you know, you have, uh, you know, let's check out your, you know, financial model is, you know, just finances. I was 14 years old. I'm like, can I understand how your business works? And, oh, okay. I can help you with your books and get those cleared up and your, you know, accounts receivable, your accounts payable. And then he's like, well, do you want to learn how to upholster furniture? I'm like, sure, why not? So then we spent several weeks and he taught me how to upholster furniture, which, you know, I've never had to replay that skill or use it again in my life. But my goodness, what a cool thing to learn. And, and, and I think the thing that, that really struck me, and he was just so gracious uh, as, a, as an employer, and it was just him and me in the shop every day. So there's just the two of us. So really like an apprenticeship in its most basic uh, historic form. And I think the thing that that showed me is that just being curious and willing to step out of uh, a comfort zone and try new things, not only was I having fun doing it, but I was being rewarded because this person I was helping was really benefiting from the fact that I was trying and helping him in, in other areas. And I find that, you know, in today's society, a lot of the folks that I see coming out of college uh, or in high school, you know, they're, they're, they come into work and they do the minimum. They do what they're asked, and then they go home. Mm. And um, and I think, if anything, I would say, you know, do the maximum. Do do more. Do it, ask what else you can do to to create value in your role. That was certainly what I did, and I think it made a huge difference in in sort of forming my work ethic. So there are two propulsions, two passions that converge in this story. One is the desire to create more value, to maximize the, the value, the service, the contribution you make, and the other concurrently to maximize the learning opportunity for yourself to, to expand into new horizons, new skills, 
new capabilities. And it's the convergence of these two that I believe propel that behavior that you're describing. Absolutely. Uh, you know, without curiosity, you don't get anywhere. Uh, in my in my opinion, you, you know, entrepreneurship isn't a study of how to build companies. It's a study of how to solve problems in a creative way. Meaning, entrepreneurship is not about being a CEO. Entrepreneur, you could be entrepreneurial as a janitor if you come up with a better way to sweep a floor. Uh, you can be entrepreneurial in any role. If you come up with a better, you, you look at things, you're curious, you ask probing questions, you seek a new way of approaching a problem, that's entrepreneurship in its most basic form. And, and that's what drives me. And it's what I, when I seek young people to come into my companies or to do work with, that's what I'm looking for. I believe you're also asserting implicitly in what you're stating that entrepreneurship is not at core a, an exercise in creating wealth. That's an, that's an outcome or an output. It is about solving problems that create meaningful impact in variety of theaters. Uh, the, the wealth creation is a byproduct, not the purpose. I believe that's what you're also stating. Absolutely true. Yeah, yeah. No, you, you don't go into anything with the hope, with the specific hope of getting rich. You go out to solve a problem. And if you are smart, you're solving a problem that's worth something to somebody. <laughs> and they'll pay you for it. Right. Right. So you have this early experience and you you are immersed with these extraordinary conversations and then you need to begin to discover who you are and, and what you are good at. And so what's the next step? What happens next as you evolve through high school and, and college? How do you take your next step? So I had an interesting... I don't know where I came up with this idea, to be honest. It, it wasn't something that was suggested to me. It was just something that I came up with. But I started, remember those old bound notebooks that we used in college to take notes? Yeah. And, and these books, I started keeping bound notebooks of ideas and observations. I, if I, you know, while I was working the summer at the upholsterer, I was just making notes about things that I observed about the way he ran his business. Or I would be making notes when my father would come home from work, he would say something about what he did at the office that day or the way he solved or addressed a particular problem. And not only would I write down my, you know, what I heard, but I would also further it and say, well, if I had that scenario in front of me, how would I do it? Would I do it differently? Would I, do I agree with the approach this person took or would I somehow choose to modify it? And it, and it put me in the frame of mind of always respectfully questioning the methodologies of the people that I was around and then documenting it. And so over the years, from the time I was about, you know, 13, 14, and I, I didn't really, I didn't even stop this practice until probably I was 40 years old as a, you know, I've, I've got shelves of these bound notebooks um, that go back decades. Are you um, able to, are you able to, um, travel down memory lane and, and share an example. Well, well you know, the, the beauty of those, the beauty of those notebooks of it wasn't, it, it's not so much the memory lane as it is the fact that what I would do is I would not only write all this stuff down, but then every year or so I would go back and I would reread all of the previous notebooks up until that moment. Mm. And what that did for me was it allowed me to connect concepts over time that I had something I might've observed five years ago all of a sudden became rele more relevant when I connected to something I learned three years prior and then something I had just heard within the last month or two. And so it, it, it allowed me to evolve my thinking in a way that was purely in my own frame of reference, right? I wasn't, I was gathering it from my own thoughts and then replaying it. And the more I did that, the more I would discover new concepts or new ways of approaching problems. You were developing the topography of meaning and connections in your head from a very early age, curating the scenery in the way you saw it and the commentary that you offer to it. It's just a, a beautiful and, and extraordinary story. It, it's, and it, you know, I found that it was very unique. As I've explained this to people over the years, like, really? You did that? That's, that's amazing. <laughs> how did you come up with that idea? I'm like, I have no idea, but I can show you these you know, walls of binders that I have or want these little notebooks that I have over the years. 
So that was sort of, that started in high school and I continued it through college and all of my, you know, I started working in high school and I worked summers every high school and all through my college career. And then somewhere late in my college career, early, you know, again, I don't remember where I came up with this idea. I came up with the idea of a superpower. And, and I use, I still use this today when I'm talking to early college, college graduates or seasoned professionals who are looking to change roles or be, and get into new things. And, and in my world, the concept of a superpower is the thing that you do that's better than everybody else you know. And it is my fundamental belief that everyone has a superpower. Everyone. doesn't matter who you are. You all, everyone has one. And, and I, this does not mean it's a skill. So I wouldn't say a, you know, someone's superpower is mathematics or statistics. It's something more fundamental about them that makes them a unique uh, producer in the world. And, and I think about it in this way, that if you find and discover and can articulate your personal superpower in a, in a very crisp manner, you can then imagine roles in the world where that superpower can be brought to bear every day. And if you can do that, you are destined to have a pretty wonderful life because you will be finding roles in which you can be excellent, apply the thing that you're better at than anybody else, which will inherently mean you will get recognized, promoted, typically financially rewarded, but certainly personally and spiritually rewarded because every day you'll enjoy doing what you do. And, and it's, it's hard to imagine somebody not having a pretty good outcome if what they do every day is play to their superpower. So I imagine that part of the discovery of the superpower of, for a person is discovering the, the zone of convergence of passion and capability or talent or what they are gifted in all those things that, that are part of the, the, the architecture, if there is such a thing, of the superpower. Uh, what else in your mind constructed the idea of the superpower and what was your superpower that you discovered? You know, the, the, the idea of the superpower, I think, came from the fact that I fundamentally believe everybody has something of value to offer. And, and it, really, it really boils down to, can you articulate your own superpower and can, you, can other people see it in you? Mm-hmm. And, and those two things were, were, you know, they sort of run hand in hand if you do it correctly. For me, and, and again, as, I'm, as I talk to people now, I describe the fact that the superpower that you might describe in your 20s is going to evolve. It's, there's no way that your superpower is static because it's a, it's a journey of self-discovery in my experience. And that is the more you learn about yourself and the more you, uh, the more you experience in the world, the more crystalline that superpower becomes to you. And so I would say, if I, if I sort of dial the clock back to the way I would have described my superpower in my 20s, I would have said, I am really out, my superpower is being very outgoing and having an insatiable appetite um, to learn how things work. I mean, I, I, have, I had just, and I still to this day have an absolute passion. I could be just as riveted sitting down with somebody who was the head of a, you know, a funeral home or a mortuary learning their, you know, teaching me about their craft as I can learning about the new generation of communication technology or, you know, rocket engine. So it really doesn't matter the subject. I just, I'm a, I'm a sap for learning. I just love learning how things work. But over time, that very amorphous concept crystallized into something that became sort of the guiding light of my career. And I now describe my superpower as selling vision. And, and what that means to me, and the way I describe it when, when asked, is to say that I am particularly gifted at not only coming up with a concept or a business opportunity, that is itself a vision of a future that does not yet exist. So I can create this world in my mind, but I can then be so persuasive in how I describe it that I can bring people to bear to make it a reality. I can bring employees. I can, I can describe it in a way that gets investors, bankers, lawyers, future customers, people that will pay me for something that is yet to be, yet to exist in the world. So this is my superpower. It's the thing I do well. And guess what? The way I apply it is by being an entrepreneur and specifically by being a CEO, because 
that's a job. The job of selling vision is a job that is unique to the CEO. And, and that's a, this the role of the CEO in my experience. And so, you know, I, could I have been a technologist? Could I have been a marketing or a salesperson? Yes, but it would not have specifically played to my unique superpower. And so that's where I realized that starting companies and being the, the, the CEO and sitting in that chair and taking that responsibility was what I was meant to do. Yeah, the beauty of this story is how it has been a, a journey of self-creation. You, you created that and shaped that superpower because your earlier story of how you are tracing ideas and learnings from your father and, and other smart people around him and then retracing to connect ideas, that capacity to connect concepts and ideas that no one connected before is ultimately the... the the fundamental inner structure and formation that enables you to sell a vision, to see a picture of the future, a future state that others do not see yet, and your ability to describe it in a way that will become actual in their mind. Uh, th th that's what's so powerful about this, the, the, <laughs> the iterative journey. So, But before we come to your role as a CEO, let's trace this phase where you complete college, and I believe you are first exploring for some time roles in a couple of large companies. What was that like? What was that phase of your journey? And what are some key learnings that you are internalizing at that stage? Yeah, so one of the things I knew when I figured out I wanted to be an entrepreneur, I also knew I needed to be trained. And, and by training, I mean I needed to be in a place with successful business people running successful businesses that I could, I could learn from their example or, or places where, as I, you said, describing my notebook concept, I could take notes and make observations that would ultimately make me a better leader. And so rather than jumping straight into entrepreneurship, I chose to go work for some large companies and, and do some very interesting roles that gave me opportunities to learn. And so the, the company that had employed me during college and then ultimately gave me a, a terrific opportunity after college uh, was uh, KLA. And at that, that time, it was KLA Instruments. It's now uh, merged with Tencore and is now KLA Tencore. Uh, but the, you know, I was a fresh college graduate, only a couple years out of school, had worked for them as you know, a, a summer engineer for several years. But you know, here I was at the age of 25, they actually gave me the opportunity to go over to Europe uh, to Switzerland and start business, a business operation for them. In, you know, to, it was going to serve all of Europe and the Middle East. Now, so I'm 25 years old and I have never run uh, anything other than managed groups within their organization. And yet they had enough faith in me to give me this opportunity. And, you know, first of all, having the opportunity to work and live outside the United States. And I lived uh, a year in Germany and two years in Switzerland taught me so much. And, and I know that, you know, you, you have uh, a broad cultural background yourself. You've moved around the world. So we've shared this in, in prior conversations, but the idea that you, you know, the opportunity to work as a young person taught me how to work cross-culturally because, you know, in my, in my office in Switzerland, we had, uh, people from nine different countries uh, and ethnic backgrounds uh, with, you know, uh, in different speaking, all different native languages, although we mostly defaulted to English. There were, you know, at least seven languages spoken regularly inside the walls of our building uh, and getting outside of the confines of the U S reading the news, working with the people and having the opportunity to sort of look back on the United States from the outside in also taught me a lot about, quite honestly, how arrogant and ignorant we in the United States can be about how we are perceived in the rest of the world. And, and it gave me a sense of humility that I've carried with me to this day, a, I, a very important one. I imagine you also at that time, you are likely managing many people who are probably older than you, which was also a discovery journey. I oh, oh, yeah. Uh, a lot of mistakes were made. Uh, a lot of times, you know, I would make a, 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 a grievous error and, and, you know, learn from it. But it, these were opportunities. And yes, I was almost always managing people who were uh, my elders in age. But it was uh, it was a it was a terrific opportunity. So that that took, you know, I was there for three years. 
when I left Europe, you know, I was 27, 28 years old and came back to work for a company that was just kind of finding its footing in the world, Cisco Systems. Now, at the time, you know, when I joined Cisco, um, late 89, 90, um, Cisco was already doing a couple hundred million dollars in revenue, but the four and a half years that I worked there, they went from a couple hundred million to five billion in revenue, which at the time was one of the fastest, if not the fastest growing companies ever in history uh, to go that quickly. And, and I had the great privilege to work with uh, and for John Morbridge, who in my opinion is the, the exemplar of the best CEO I have ever met or come in contact with and a, and a person to whom uh, I, you know, I aspire to be like John Morgridge as a CEO. He was just a, a guiding light for me. And even amongst all the CEOs that I knew and had met, and as I said, were friends of my father's, John was a, a very, he stands out in my memory. What, what about him is, was so unique? You know, he, he was an incredible blend of tough but fair, goofy in the extreme, but incredibly respected smart but didn't have to be the smartest guy in the room you know didn't have to you know throw his weight around just you know an ability to see through the clutter and figure out the, the appropriate thing to do in the moment um, and not get distracted by a lot of other maybe less important issues he was incredibly focused and just an, a truly inspirational leader you know he, he took no guff but he was incredibly fair and so you know i i of all the guys I've worked with around or for, I'm, I continue to, to put John at the top of my list as a guy that I would love to be like someday. And, and the biggest learning for you from seeing the, the rapid scaling and growth at Cisco at that time was what? That good management is so important. That, that you, know, you, can, you can do a lot with great leadership. Uh, but if, man, if you throw... Uh, bad or arrogant leadership into the mix, you can really mess things up. And I, I think Cisco did an amazing job as a leadership team, not only in, in navigating the waters of their own ascension, but also in how they went through in the early days and managed their acquisitions. Uh, there was a lot of growth through acquisition at that time. They did a terrific job there. Um, but it really started uh, from the top down. And I, you know, I, I say said, I got to work with Morgridge. He was succeeded by John Chambers, who I have also tremendous respect for and enjoyed working with him tremendously also. So, you know, not to, you know, I just relative scale, I think mortgage was amazing, but yeah, I would, I would describe their ascension to, to terrific leadership and terrific sales execution. That was really the thing that they did extraordinarily well. And so during that time, you are following your plan. You are immersing yourself in the experience of a large company so that you can be trained do you also concurrently all the time in the back of your mind looking for opportunities, wondering what will you do next? When will you unleash the, the entrepreneurial quest in you? Or is it more a process of this is quietly happening in the background and it finding you? Just take me through that phase and that transition and how you, you unleash the entrepreneurial spirit uh, into action. I think it was a little bit of both. Interesting, that you, you know, the way you turn that phrase and the question, I would say I knew all along that my destination was to start my own company, but I never set a timeline for it, nor did I have a specific idea that I was holding in reserve for the right opportunity to unleash. It was very much a sense that I'll know when an opportunity is in front of me or that I, either I come up with one or I'm presented with one that is worth my time to go pursue. And, and I never had any doubt that I would find it. I just didn't put a timeline on it, nor was I worried about it in that time frame. Let me just put a magnifying glass on what you just said. This is so big, so important, because what you are explaining there and expressing there is a dual trust, a trust in yourself that when something is real, when a real opportunity is in front of you, you will know it. And also a complete trust and, and confidence and conviction that opportunities will show up for you. Uh, this probably is, is to do with the earlier experience, again, of what you've been exposed to. But it's, it's that confidence and trust that is so critical 
if you are to truly listen to your intuition and recognize a real opportunity rather than chase a dream that has no concrete uh, future to it. Indeed. And, and I, I would say, you know, it was at that point too, that I developed another methodology that I still use today, which is, you know, pressure, you know, try and kill aggressively kill every idea I come up with. And, and, and I'll expound on that because it's, it's, uh, it's counterintuitive for most people. And, and I, again, I give this as counsel to most entrepreneurs that I work with, which is you come up with an idea or you're presented with an idea, do everything in your power to try and mangle it and kill it. Come up with every reason why it's going to fail. Come up with you know, all the things you could do that would, uh, you know, new technologies you could come up with that would, that would change the outcome. And And if you can solve every single problem you come up with, what you're left with is a good idea, is probably worth doing. It's certainly worth making a serious run at because if you've you've really honestly dug in and and pressure tested it hard, and and, and my wife to this day jokes about the fact that DocuSign is the idea that would not die because at the time I started that company, I'd, I'd work on it for weeks at a time. And then all of a sudden, um, I'd, I'd say to her, she said, well, how's it going? And I'd say, no, I found the fatal flaw. And then I'd stop working on it for a little while. And then a week or two later, she'd say, well, what are you working on now? And I'd say, well, I'm back at DocuSign. She said, I thought you killed that. And I said, yeah, but I figured a way around it. <laughs> and and, and, I, and I, found, I found a solution to the problem that I came up with, the fatal flaw. And, I, and it kept going like that for the better part of a year. Um, where I would find the flaw and I'd say, oh, okay, it's done. I can't, I, I, I've killed it. And then I'd find a way around it. And by the time I had exhausted all of those options, what was left in, the, in that crucible was what became the company. And it, and it was just like that, that, you know, and I, and I, and I challenge all the young entrepreneurs I meet. I'm like, make sure you've done this for your business before you try and start it and get investors to sign up to do it and, and make sure, you know, really go after it. So was Docu uh, was DocuSign your first company, or was there a company before DocuSign that, that you? No, there was there was a first one, and, and in fact, you know, this was another uh, great learning opportunity. The one that preceded DocuSign, uh, you know, mid nineties, nineteen ninety five. I started a company called Point dot com, and, and in nineteen ninety five, we had we were at a point you know, where we had quote discovered the internet. Uh, we had World Wide Web. Um, we were just kind of figuring out HTML. And web pages, et cetera, were starting to pop up and, and companies were doing things, but nobody understood what that was going to lead to. And there was no such thing as e-commerce. But I partnered with a guy and we said, you know what? We probably could sell things online. Um, and we, we started out building a technology that was uh, the very first comparison shopping tool set. Uh, eventually ended up licensing that as a big part of our, our outcome. And then the very first online purchasing opportunity for cell phones. Uh, we created a, a, a whole business around that and, and built the biggest uh, retail operation online uh, for wireless devices and, and service in the United States and ultimately sold that. And, you know, I learned a ton from that experience. I know it was my first company. I, I realized how much I had yet to learn. I, you know, again, you make a lot of mistakes the first time around. Um, I did. I was very fortunate that I was I learned how to build a very good board. That was a, a great takeaway. Uh, the other takeaway I would say was that I, when I left that company, I, I built that company up to a certain level, and then you know I, I wanted to go off and explore new new territories, and I made the mistake of staying on the board when I when I stepped down and I hired my replacement, and that was informative for the the next stage of my life because I realized after the fact that being on the board of a company you founded where all the other board members are people you put in the chair and all the other executives are the people you put in the chair, including the CEO that took over your role, meant that every time I came on campus uh, for board meetings, everybody would ask my opinion. And and somehow my opinion was, I would say, causing the the new CEO to to not be getting his day in the sun. Right. And, and, And really was undercutting him without me even intending to do that. And, and so, when uh, when that opportunity presented itself again, you know, DocuSign was my second company. You know, I, I ran that company for five and a half years, and when I stepped down from that CEO role, I actually, when I stepped down as CEO, I also stepped off the board because of that prior experience. And everyone was like, "Why would you do that?" Like, because the new guy that comes in, he's got to have a 
a really a good opportunity to succeed. And if I'm still here and everybody's still listening to me, that's not going to happen. Yeah. What's inspiring about this story? I see <clears throat> and work every day with, with people. And, and most of us, we need to repeat the same mistakes time and time again. You decided to actually apply that learning and not repeat that same mistake again. Yeah. And, and again, it goes back to the sort of discipline of looking at my old notebooks and realizing, okay, well, this is how I thought I wanted to handle it. Let's make sure I handle it the right way this time. So point.com was in some way the lead uh, before Amazon, before uh, eBay, before Craigslist. Uh, you, you were um, in the very, very early stages, perhaps the first to, to e-commerce that obviously later exploded. We weren't the first. So I, I, that would not be the right because, uh, you know, Jeff Bezos and I met early on. He was he was here starting uh, Amazon at the same time. Um, in fact, uh, roughly in the same years. So we, you know, we were kind of all figuring out what e-commerce was looking like. He was, of course, building the world's biggest bookstore. I was building the world's biggest online cellular retail establishment. So, and we were having lots of dialogues back and forth between Amazon and Point.com about how how would we merge these at marketplaces? Is there an opportunity to merge these marketplaces? Should we do that? All of these things were happening. There were other platforms that were being built, like Amazon, at that time. Um, but we were all pioneers in that context. There, you know, nobody knew that it would take over the way it has and really turn into what it's become. We had an inkling, but uh, there was so much yet to learn. At what point do you tell yourself or look in the mirror and, and, and tell yourself you're not looking at a success story, at, at a successful person, or, or was it never the case that you needed to to give yourself that uh, kind of commentary. And I, I suppose I'm asking in that also, what was and how has your definition of success evolved through those different steps? You know, I think we all measure ourselves based on outcomes. And, you know, I was fortunate that the, uh, the outcomes for the things that I was involved with were generally, you know, perceived as positive. And, you know, they weren't, you know, the point.com was not the home run that DocuSign has become rel on a relative scale, but it wasn't a failure either. Um, and, you know, we learned a lot. We sold the company. It was, a, it was a reasonable outcome under the circumstances. So in terms of how do I define success? Gosh, that's a great question. You know, I think it's a, you know, I, I counsel my kids along these same lines. And I say, you know, when I say confidence doesn't, come from your haircut, your clothing, something exterior, external to you, it comes from the inside. And I think something that has always kind of been with me is just a sense of, like I, you know, I said earlier, there's going to be an idea and I'll know when it's there. Uh, there's sort of always been an inner confidence that says, I can do this. I, I can, uh, you know, what I'm doing, even if I'm uh, failing in one measure, I'm learning in another, in which case I'll take that and apply it to the next thing I do, which will make it even more successful. Right. And perhaps so the, the purest definition of success, one that is completely free of the opinion of other people, is that you decide to do something and you follow through on what you set out to do, including when you fall on your face and learn from your mistakes and, and so on. That commitment and that follow through is in some way the purest definition of success. Then it is the outcome that that that, that effort and endeavor led to. So I, I, I suppose I'm proposing there a multi-layer definition of success. But the first is you set out to do something, and you you uh, went about doing it, and that in itself is a success. Indeed, and that's to me that's always they talk people talk about you know the journey. Is, is the thing that you should be focused on, not always the destination. And I, I'm a big believer that, that you're always learning. Your journey is, is perpetual. It's ongoing. You know, the thirst for learning should be never ending. And even when you fail, that's a learning opportunity. Learn from that. Take it forward. Don't beat yourself up over it. Just keep going. Uh, I, you know, and I learned a lot, even, even in, in things... Uh, you know, even things that were perceived as successes, that the external were perceived as successes, the, inside, the internal guts of it, you, you still learn a lot along the way. You described a minute ago how you applied to DocuSign the strategy of trying to kill the idea and, and you went and 
solved one step after the other, the, all the obstacles. Let's retrace through that and just slow the process down a bit. Are you able to trace? The, because what I'm interested in is this incubation phase when you're, it's all happening in your head. Mm. And are you able to trace the genesis of the idea and how it has developed? Question one. And then question two, I'm, I'm interested that you just put a little bit of a magnifying glass on how DocuSign then was realized as a home run success story. Well, I, you know, I will give credit to the genesis of the idea to my co-founder, Tom Gonzer. Tom uh, had worked for me as my VP of business development at Point.com. Uh, he had then uh, graduated from Point.com and gone off to start his own company. And uh, I kind of helped him do that and get connected. That's fine. Then he had, uh, this was now years had passed because uh, he had probably left Point.com in maybe 19... 80, uh, sorry, 98, I would say. So 98, so it was thereabouts. And um, maybe 99, he'd gone out and started his own thing. And it was, uh, you know, the fall of 2003. And he, and he calls me up and he says, hey, I'm uh, no longer running my company that I started, but I'm still on the board. And uh, along the way, we bought the assets of another venture here in Seattle that had gone under. And my board wants to get rid of them. And I think there might be some value in them. And he, he pitched me an idea. He said, I'd love to work with you again. Can we, you know, I, I loved working for you before. I'd love to work with you again. Can we figure out a way to, to do something with these assets? And, and the assets were some old software and a, and a portfolio of intellectual properties and patents that had been issued. And so I poured through them with him. And he pitched me an idea on a big document management company that, that he thought he wanted to build out of this thing. And I said, you know... Not sure that's the right idea. And we started pressure testing again, going through that modes of failure, modes of competition. How much money do you need to raise? How would you make money doing this thing? And it, it continued to kind of crystallize, crystallize, crystallize until one day I looked at him and I said, you know what? The best thing in this entire portfolio of concepts and ideas is this concept of online signing. What if we just did an online signing tool that allowed us to connect all the big companies that did, that took, uh, electronic documents and created them, Word and, and PDF and you know Adobe and these other things, and create the the virtual bridge to connect them to all the all the platforms that store documents, whether that's EMC or any big backend storage and and uh, monetization platforms. Because there's this odd little window of time in the document's life where it's going from an electronic document that's been created, then it has to be extracted from the world of the digital to the world of the physical to be executed with a signature. And then guess what? It needs to be reinserted back into the digital world to be acted upon. I'm like, if we can create this one little bridge and set up a toll booth in front of that, that bridge and take a little toll for everything that needs to be signed that crosses that chasm between those two big sets of platforms, we're going to have a winner on our hands. And that was it. And that was the fundamental concept that bore that is, not, that is DocuSign, that is still DocuSign, that has been from day one. So part of the wisdom of that is that you identified a narrow enough, a small enough problem that you could zero in and focus a solution on. Absolutely true. Focus is so critical. You just can't, as an early stage company, lose that ever. And, and taking on a big idea is, is commendable, but foolish in most cases. You have to have big, big goals, but you have to be able to boil them down into something that's, that's manageable in the current, in the present. And, and again, defining the reality that, you know, did I want to have to raise money to compete with Microsoft and Adobe and EMC? No, hell no. <laughs> so, and, and they would have squashed us if we tried. Right. So, so, you know, we, we had to do something that they weren't doing or couldn't do and then, and then make them our partner, make them, make them work with us or vice versa. What's the next step for you after DocuSign? What's your next move? So, so I got really excited when Barack Obama got, ex got elected in 2008 that the next big wave of technical innovation was going to come in renewable energy. So I stepped out at DocuSign you know, to go form my next company. And, and I think the thing that I'll highlight here, Aviv, is you know, my journey has been one of what I call a stage one founder. And what I mean by that is I believe that there are three phases of life of a company. There is stage one, which is you know, napkin to product market fit, which is all of the very treacherous waters of figuring out what the business model is, testing it, fixing it, 
breaking stuff, failing lots, being on the verge of death multiple times, and then finally finding the product market fit. That's phase one. Phase two is rap is high growth, which is I found the product market fit and now I need to just sell the heck out of it and do lots and lots more of it you know, very, very quickly. Then comes phase three and phase three is profitability where you say, I've now sold a lot of it. I proved that I can do a lot and make it into a big business. Now I'm going to start, you know, my, maybe my rate of growth isn't as high as it was in, the, in phase two, but now I need to control my costs, control my production methodologies, do something to, to eke larger and larger profit out of that enterprise. And, and I look at my, you know, again, back to my superpower, what I love and what I'm particularly good at is phase one. And so you'll, you'll hear repeated in my story that as soon as I get to the point of product market fit in any of my companies, I'll either sell it or turn it over to another CEO and go, on, go back to the beginning and start again. Just on the map of the three phases, is there a phase four of renewal and breaking into new innovation and, and possibilities? You know, that's a, that's a great point. I, absolutely. The older companies, I think, have absolutely done, some of them have navigated that water pretty darn well. And others have not, and you've seen them, you know, in the dustbin of the of, of the history books. That's right. Um, and so, uh, yes, there's definitely a phase four. It often means, you know, many companies don't navigate that fourth phase successfully. But anyway, that you know, getting back to sort of how this affected my journey. So I've always chosen to go back to the beginning and start the next thing rather than be the guy that leads it into phase two, because typically in phase two is when I'm starting to get bored. Because right. if it's just repeating the same thing over and over. It's also, it also follows a broader philosophy that I've had since day one about being an entrepreneur, which is to say that your most valuable asset as an entrepreneur is your time. And, you know, the, 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 and statistically speaking, most entrepreneurial ventures are not wildly successful. And most of them fail. And so, so if you're going to be an entrepreneur, and that is your career path, in my opinion, the wisest way to approach that is as a building a portfolio of your own effort where you don't spend more than five years typically on any one entity. And that if you, you know, whatever, wherever you are roughly at around year five, it's about time to step back and start again, because at, at five years, you'll either have a, a winner on your hands or a loser on your hands, or maybe something in between. But the point is its outcome is largely determined at that point. And if I spend another five years and then another five years beyond that, the net return to me personally, both in terms of experience, financial, and every other way, is diminishing versus going back to the beginning again and starting the next one. And so in my world, I've created a portfolio of companies that are mine, where I had a, you know, a, a founder's share. And obviously, some have been more successful than others. But at the end of the day, even if some of them had completely failed, the, the, the net result is I wasn't, all the eggs were in one basket. And, and, and throughout that window of time, I'm creating learning and value and opportunity to, to, to create a new thing in the next go round. So the, you know, the, the DocuSign experience was one where when I you know, reached that point of product market fit, the company was growing quickly. Uh, it still had obviously a long ways to go, but you know, I saw an opportunity to step out and do a new thing, which I took, and that was to start a renewable energy company in 2008 uh, in the field of biodiesel and and try a whole different kind of business model. You know, a cash based or a, you know, a cash flow based business versus a venture backed business, something that would that would just be a cash cow, and ultimately create an opportunity that had no employees, no office, and I just sat back and received checks, which was great financially. However, it was not very personally fulfilling as it turned out. So that's what drove me to start Metabrite, is that by the time uh, my third company was, was returning money, uh, I was, it was just like, oh, okay, well, I don't have to actually do anything. I've already done all the work up front. I, I, I'm getting bored. I need to start something else. So, but the fascinating transition there is you're moving into a completely different space, not the, the kind of technology <laughs> space you, you've been in before. Indeed, I, I've had uh, multiple investors who've followed me through the years and invested in various different companies ask me why I never seem to start businesses in the same industry. And they're like, you know, you, you spend all this time and energy learning an industry and getting good at it, and then you go start a business in something completely different. I'm like, yeah, 
because A, I want to learn something new, and B, the fundamentals of starting a company are true whether you're making toilet paper or integrated circuits. You know, it's a different process, but the fundamentals of, you know, you're coming up with a new process, you're debugging a cycle, you're selling things to people that didn't buy, you know, didn't know what you had before. All of these things are repeatable, and that's what I'm good at. I can find experts in the field that I want to pursue to be domain experts. My domain of expertise is startups. And so when I bring that to the table, I can I can do it in any domain. So the next move after that is into the company you're leading today, correct? Correct. Yep. But, but let me just clarify this idea, this construct of the five-year cycle. Was that something you had earlier on in, in your 20s or that's something that you developed more as a retrospective view? No, it was actually something I developed very early. So I knew that I didn't want to spend, you know, 20 years in a particular company uh, that I started. That that was, you know, I'd watched entrepreneurs go through that cycle. And, and again, it's it's a it was a function of self-awareness uh, combined with the fact that, you know, where my passion lay was, was really under. I, I would say, you know what, interesting. I, if, as I think about it, it was a little bit of both. I think my experience at Point.com, which is my my first startup, as I went through that cycle, I realized, okay, I, I you know we're at a phase where the next the next step, level of growth, I think there's going to be somebody that's going to be better at it than me. So let's go find that person. And you know the part I really liked about this business it was the part at the beginning. And and I knew at a very high level again looking at. at entrepreneurs over the years and all my notebooks and kind of looking back over who'd been successful and who hadn't, that, that it took different skills to run companies at different stages. And I just sort of started to intuit the fact that my, my skill was in stage one. And this idea, I'd always held this idea that by, being, by moving through different companies over time, you had a higher probability of a successful career as an entrepreneur versus a successful st- singular startup. So I was never focused as much on any one of these startups being uniquely successful, only that in the aggregate, all of, all of the things that I might try would lead to success as an entrepreneur. What's uh, so compelling for me in your story is because I've always believed a bit like your idea that, that you discover the superpower, that self-insight, self-knowledge is the beginning of every success that a person come to discover and recognize who they are, what they are about, and what's unique that they bring to the table. But then there is another dimension to it, which is people often, even when they find that, they veer off that focus. They lose the integrity of that self-insight because of a variety of reasons. They stay engaged beyond the point of uh, efficacy and so on. You, for one reason or another, or, or you were very well focused in, in the way you self-directed your journey, made these judgment calls of when it was time to move on with this framework of, yeah, possibly the five-year cycle. And that philosophy led you um, from one thing to the next. So it, it, very compelling. And it leads me to the next question. What else will you identify as part of your leadership philosophy and because you've you've seen different leaders you spoke about successful ceos how would you define what is your leadership philosophy and and uh, the kind of leaders that are required whether it's for the three phases or overall leadership philosophy is interesting i think the, the way i perceive leadership is bring smart people around you and let them do their job so that's very basic. I think, you know, one of the things that I am always trying to do is ask smart questions. I said earlier that one of the things that I've always been passionate about is learning and 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 naturally inquisitive by nature. And so often I find that my style, if I had to describe it to somebody, is one of, of layered inquisition, inquisitiveness in the sense that I'm I'm very, uh, I'll sit in a meeting and I'll just ask tons of questions and really try and understand the thought process of the person uh, across the table from me, probing deep, you know, again, it kind of goes into the idea of finding the fatal flaw. 
can you, through discussion, through communication, through conversation, expose either the, all the good and all the bad and at least the thought process and the journey of the thought that allows you to really harden it in, in such a way that it's not, a, it's not an outcome that's specifically owned by a, an individual, but it's an outcome that when, when, when we leave a room as a leadership team or myself with, a, with an individual, we've come to an understanding of the best approach to take to solve a particular problem or to achieve a particular outcome. And we've done that through layered discussion and discovery. The way I distill what you just said there, Court, is that leadership is a function and a process of insatiable inquiry. And it, it is completely convergent with the, the core message that I attempted to frame in Create New Futures that when, when I wrote the book, which is that leadership is a process of creating the future by shaping conversations. You happen to have, and I've witnessed you in action, a unique and, and rare ability that you, you're sharing here today, how you've developed that capacity to ask these questions and, and identify all the reasons why an idea must be killed <laughs> or why it will be successful. Uh, but but the, the big message I just distilled uh, from what you said is leadership is an inquiry journey, an inquiry function. And what, what's compelling about it, most people will think that leadership is about telling other people what to do and demonstrating the action of it. You're proposing now a leader is first somebody that would lead the, the inquiry. Without a doubt, I, I you know I often describe my style, and I would say other you know not unique to me as as that of the inverted pyramid, where the the, the role of the CEO is at the bottom. The point is at the, is sort of holding up the organization in the sense that I must support the the goals and objectives of the rest of the organization through inquiry and through empowerment, and it's not them supporting me. And, and me being elevated into some unusual status as the CEO, it's, it's quite the opposite. I am a servant of them and the needs of the business. And, and whatever I can do to help distill an idea, uh, crystallize it, uh, empower it, or empower a person to achieve an outcome that will make the business move forward and along the right trajectory, that's the way I see my role. Yes, indeed. What technology spaces and trends do you follow now with interest? Gosh, there are a number. I, I think um, automation of personal vehicles, so all of the, the self-driving car technologies, um, and, and then beyond that, the, the automation of delivery, whether that's through drones or other, other self-directed modes of transportation, I think that is going to radically change our world. I think the, the development of what, what is being described now as as localized or on-the-spot manufacturing um, through 3D printing or on-demand uh, manufacturing is also could absolutely transform our future. And then and virtual reality. So in each of these things, so motion of persons, vehicles, delivery, I think we're, we're going to find, you know, uh, ways of, of moving ourselves place to place that have, you know, higher reliability, lower environmental impact, higher safety, protocols, uh, lower levels of consumer uh, of spending, et cetera. And, and then the, the, the goods delivery side, automation of delivery, again, you know, in, in lower environmental footprint, you know, smarter ways of moving things point to point. I think there's just a ton of social communal impact that's going to happen around that. Uh, the manufacturing part I mentioned, the, you know, localized manufacturing, that's just going to radically change how we think about supply chains and sourcing of goods and products and materials. You know, the whole uh, move to offshore production of products and goods and goods will will now start to re onshore in a way because you'll start to see people being able to basically print or produce whole lines of products on demand as they're being ordered. So, customer, you know, the the vision of this future is people being able to say, you know, I want a, you know, product X and they, you know, they place their order on you know, the amazon.com of the future. And rather than having to, you know, that thing was pre-produced somewhere, you know, in a factory in China, then shipped to a warehouse in LA where it was then shipped to a distribution center in 
in Nashville that was then sent to you in you know New York, there's going to be a little you know a, a place outside of Manhattan that's just going to basically make that thing from scratch. Is a bunch of printed parts, assemble it, and deliver it to your door within a couple of hours. It, it's going to just dramatically change the way we think about product production and delivery. And the last one, virtual reality, is to me, I know I've, I've got a daughter that's studying computer science and visual media and is you know, now working in the gaming industry. You know, the gaming industry is on the forefront of a brand new mode of communication, in my experience. It's the convergence of uh, audio, visual, live, real-time ways and, and rapid modeling of surfaces. And you know, I envision a future where you know, if you and I wanted to have a conversation and it didn't matter where you were, we slap on our goggles or whatever our interface device is, and, and we're having a, what, a, what to us feels like an absolute face-to-face -face conversation, no matter how far away we are physically from one another. And we could make that setting wherever we want to have that conversation, at a cafe and the, you know, underneath the Arc de Triomphe, or we could be in you know, New York, or we could be in your living room or my living room. And it'll feel like that's where we are. And I think that it, th those things to me are just fascinating. I, I love dreaming about what's possible. Do you sense that there is a next new venture for you, Endeavor, after MetaBright, or, or this is, for now, uh, what you will be focused on for a while? No, MetaBright is definitely in a, in a stage where I'm having a blast. So <laughs> I'm, I'm still in that very joyful, you know, building it and finding the product market fit and, and the growth. And, and, you know, there's a, I'm, I'm not thinking about moving on from that specifically uh, anytime soon, but yeah, I already have ideas for what's next. <laughs> I, always, I always have some ideas. Uh, you just mentioned your, your daughter. I'm curious. Um, your father was such a huge influence and, and, uh, inspirational figure for you. What was it like to take that exampleship and, and try to be as, uh, as impressive a father yourself, that, that is a journey by itself, I imagine. <laughs> you know, the thing I only ever wanted for any of my kids, and I've got three daughters, is that, that love of asking questions and being inquisitive and, and always, always, always putting your best foot forward, you know, putting out the maximum amount of effort, not the minimum. And so, you know, I've always said, that, you know, that I don't care what, what level of grades you get or what you achieve in the world, but if you're always putting in your best effort and you're respectful of the people around you and you're asking questions, I'm happy. I, you know, you'll, you'll have a great life and, I'll, and, I'll be, and you'll be proud of yourself and I'll be proud of you. And, and you know, I've got to say that my, I've got great kids and, and yeah, they make, every kid makes mistakes, but they learn from those mistakes and that's what hopefully will you know, forge them into uh, strong people. That's great uh, and, and inspiring to, to hear. As we approach uh, lending in this uh, exploration, what are you focusing on in your own development, in your own growth still at this time? You know, at this stage in my career, I'm spending a lot of time mentoring young people. And it's, it's my way of giving back. A lot of people offer community services, their time, uh, late in their life or when they have the opportunity to do so. To me, uh, working with entrepreneurs, sharing the path and, and whatever wisdom I can, either through advisory roles, board roles, or just meeting with people over coffee and, and listen, letting them talk to me and pitch ideas and letting me ask them questions that might, might help them ask tougher questions of themselves. So I spend a lot of time kind of learning how to be a mentor. You know, I'm always on the, on the path. I'm always reading good books, and I, I loved your, your book of Creating New Futures. I'm about halfway through it, I'll admit. I haven't made it all the way through, but the fundamental premise is absolutely spot on. But I love to read, and I love to work with, with smart business leaders, and I'm always learning about how to be a better leader. And then I guess at this stage, too, because I, I've been sufficiently successful that I can turn around and help others, not just in terms of mentorship, but also in terms of funding and, and having an opportunity to learn how to be a good investor. You know, I, I can experience it from, I've seen both bad and good investment uh, made, and I'd love to find models that can make investment more successful over time. So that's an, that's an area of exploration that I'm spending a fair amount of time on. What qualifies as good investment and, and what, have, what are some of the early discoveries as you explore and develop this insight? 
it comes from an experience of working with with a, a lot of professional venture capital while very well meaning has not as as individuals come through the world of startups in their personal experience and as a consequence they often provide guidance to companies that is fully well intentioned but entirely off point and and so my my idea about good investment has a lot more to do with being able to apply the learnings of being a good being a good entrepreneur and understanding the the subtleties of the decisions that entrepreneurs have the very difficult and and unique decisions that face uh, executives or entrepreneurs in a startup environment and helping guide them through those rocky waters and those very difficult decisions not just give them capital um but hopefully bring something more than than the capital brings and that is solid experience right capital and brain and mind and much more which which i think everybody wants to do and i think that the problem is just being a smart person and and being successful in a particular walk of life doesn't mean that you're going to be successful at giving advice to startups so as we bring this to lending this has been a an absolutely fascinating and and riveting conversation what parting message would you offer especially with this um idea and focus that that you just pointed to which is that you're spending more and more time as a mentor to young up and coming entrepreneurs what what parting message will you offer can you offer to people listening to create new futures always be inquisitive always start by listening not just talking I think we do too a little too much of too much talking and not enough listening in general. Spend whatever amount of time it takes to define your personal superpower and and be very thoughtful about creating that and and I understanding it and I'll tell you that if you find it and you can express it in a in a couple of words or you know and it, once you've discovered it it will be like a tuning fork going off in your brain. It, you'll just know that you're you're on the right path. and and once you've got that understand the roles in the world that would make that um superpower come to life every day and make that your focus of your career that is without a doubt my most important advice to any young person and it's the one that's it's very very hard to do because it's very hard to be self and you know to be really introspective enough to really discover that superpower i think people don't they don't dive deep enough and i think they have to be very thoughtful about that But if you do that and you and you can find roles that fulfill that I'd say that's a that's a great start. And as your story reveals once you find it continue to stay attuned such that it evolves for you and you evolve it as you move along your journey. Without a doubt. Yeah yeah you it's always going to it's it will continue to evolve but if you stay true to that and give yourself an opportunity to continue to work in the space that that makes that the focus of your daily life you'll you'll find success. This has been great. Thank you so much. Hey, Aviv, it was a my pleasure and uh thanks for asking. Here we are. We've landed this create new future journey and it's your time now to take action. Here are a few steps you can take this week immediately. First, reflect on Cort's idea of the superpower. Cort's insight is that by identifying what you do better than everybody else you know and then clearly articulating this superpower and discovering the roles and situations that will enable you to work from that sweet spot that you will be able to create distinctive contribution and live a life of fulfillment and joy second become even more entrepreneurial about your work and your life Ask probing questions, connect ideas and possibilities to solve the needs you serve in new and better ways. Focus on your learnability, the ability to learn in every situation. Objection and rejection offer learning opportunities. Be confident, resilient, and tenacious. Seek to understand and then apply your learning. Third, find opportunities to mentor and coach the people hoping to learn from your experience codify your insights develop your teachable message 
teaching and coaching are the fastest ways to accelerate your own next development and evolution. One more thing, you can reach me directly by phone and on email to explore how we can help you and your team create your new future. See you next time.